Hello and welcome everyone to the show. My name is Tim Hayden and I'll be your host. We have a magnificent show for you today. Our guest is the fantastic Justin D. Justin is an actor known for Ryan's Hope, Santa Barbara, As the World Turns, but he's best known as Buzz Cooper in the hit show Guiding Light. He is a nine-time Daytime Emmy Award nominee where he won six Emmys and two of those were for Outstanding Lead Actor. Please welcome Justin to the show. Welcome. Hey there. How are you, sir? I'm pretty good. I'm still kicking, you know? The, the, the nice thing about this time of life is that, you know, if you wake up, that's great. That's absolutely right. I agree with that. Uh, and how is your beautiful wife doing, by the way? My beautiful wife is in Nashville having a time, I think, having a great time. Some, some uh, very rich, wonderful guys like uh, trying to produce a play, and so they're having a, you know, they're going to see the Grand Old Opry doing skeet shooting and reading plays together. So she's doing <laughs> just fantastic. For those of you who don't know, his wife played Margot on His World Turns. Her name is Margaret Collins. Dees. <laughs> no, Margaret Collins. It's not Dees. Oh, okay. Well, it's <laughs> no, funny it's, because it during my research, uh, it showed some of your family members on one site, and it, was, it listed her as uh, alternate name as Margaret Dees. That is her alternate name. That's what. That's when she's fleeing the IRS. Yeah, she's. she's just... <laughs> that's right. So, what was it like for you growing up? Me growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to start. I like to start way back to the beginning. That never happened, actually. So it's it's, <laughs> it's a really short answer that way. I was like, uh, I was, I, I was not a. Uh, uh, an army brat, but we. I went to like eleven different schools through high school and we like we lived in mexico and iran and uh, oh my god everything from florida to to new york to cincinnati to like all over the place so i you know so i never got like i didn't have any continuity right you know it was just good in some ways but it's not really good for somehow girls are better at that stuff than the guys are but, so at, at what point was it was it your or your child when you just thought about acting and thought that maybe your interest? You know what? I think my mother saw it before me. I thought I was Julie Andrews for a few moments and I'd be singing all over the place <laughs> in, the, in the house and everybody like objected to it, and made fun of me. But I think I felt I, I saw uh, Olivia's Othello, which is very uh, uh, would get me canceled now. And I, and but he was startlingly brilliant. And I, I was watching with my friends, like in the balcony of a movie for like English, English class in Hampton, Virginia. And uh, I was breathtaking that somebody could become somebody else. And then I started listening to records of like uh, Gil Good and Olivier and Schofield. And I listened to like tons and tons and tons of like, you know, like vinyl. I don't know if you remember, they had vinyl records. Oh, yeah. back then and and so i had like stacks of them and i've listened to shakespeare all over the bloody place not wanting to be an actor at all but uh going like it was magic that you could be you could actually become somebody else for like a, an hour or something like that and yeah. that's what did it and then my mom started taking me to like plays i was going like why are we going here because she she knew that i wasn't good at anything so she was hope, hopefully saying well maybe he's good at this and uh so uh i I think that's what happened. That's how that's how I got like hooked on it, and then I just uh, fell in love with that. So I'm like the tip. Of, I'm the like quintessential amateur actor who wants to pretend he's somebody else, which is like just you know like a child. So you were starting. You started out in theater then. Uh yeah. You, oh my god, before. theater. Yeah, I was doing. Uh, that's all I wanted to do, actually. But my uh, my quest in the United States, what, my fantasy was to be doing a lead role. Uh, well, actually, not even just to walk on the stage in the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, and I got to do that. So I got to do lead roles at the at the, at the Guthrie Theater. So like like my all, all my all my twenties and like the, to like the mid thirties was uh, theater. I mean, I did like a trillion plays and uh, uh, loved it. And if you ha and if you happen to see me, I was I apologize, but I was doing my best. <laughs> no, I, I I missed out on a lot of that uh, the theater. I wish I was closer to theaters to be able to go. You gotta go to Louisville. 
Yes, I know it's going to Louisville. Uh, <laughs> I did crimes, you, they started Crimes of the Heart there. I, did, I was the first person in Crimes of the Heart in uh, uh, Baltimore stage, uh, ba- center stage. And uh, they started that in Louisville. So that, you know, that was, uh, that, they have great theater down there. Yes, there's two up there. Uh, I was just researched them after you and I had a conversation up last week. I had started looking some up just to see. Uh, and I think I know the one that you were at. Uh, what was your first on-screen job? Mm, my first on-screen job. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I, I remember, like, I did. I did a. a, a it was an, a movie, a TV movie, I think. And I was. It was very funny because I actually I've ridden horses ever since I was a kid. And I'm not as brave as my children are. They like they just take off with horses going to the place, but I like I'm okay. And they they put me on a horse like it was a Revolutionary War kind of like thing. And so I had to like go uh, charge up and tell somebody some important news and charge back on the horse. And of course they like most uh, uh, theater TV people they don't have no idea what horses are about. And so they had cables all over the place. The horse was terrified of the cables, <laughs> so it was quite 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 an experience. And uh, I think that was my first, you know, so you like, you, you practice your lines and everything like in your, in your hotel room and think that you're going to be doing this and doing that. And no, you're just trying to survive upon a horse while everybody's watching it. So, you know, <laughs> you didn't care what you said or how you act or how you look. Oh my God. So I, that was my first, I think. What's your most memorable audition? Most. Oh, I that do you have can talk about. <laughs> no, 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 no. There are, there are a lot of great ones. It's a, it's a ter- I, I was auditioning for, uh, they were doing Am- the first production of Amadeus in New York. And uh, Peter Hall, who was the, the um, uh, you know, Rebecca Hall's dad now, but he's, I think he's dead. I don't know if he's dead. But uh, he was the uh, uh, guy that ran the National Theater of Great Britain. And he was there. And so the, the, uh, writer who had seen me and the uh, casting director, both of those people had just loved me. And they brought me in with like a couple of the guys and to, to audition and for Amadeus. And, uh, and so I went and did my, did my thing. And so Peter, Peter Hall said, listen, he's not, he's not the lead. Number one, this guy. And he's uh, absolutely, can you lighten your voice up? And I said something like, well, if I'm doing it, he's the lead. I mean, to Peter Hall, for God's sakes. I was like, I'm oh my Yeah, really. And he, he laughed at that. And then I did it. And then I did exactly the same audition. I didn't change one bit to him. And he like, looked at me and laughed and went, this man's an idiot. And that was it. So that was, that was a memorable audition. But I mean, there were like, and, and also like, and there were like, uh, uh, um, I remember when I was just dishing for um, Death of a Salesman on Broadway that Dustin Hoffman was doing. And, uh, and, and Arthur Miller was there and Patty Lapone who I went to school with was there. And uh, they said, um, you know, we had to wait because, because Dustin Hoffman, we were waiting for Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman comes in and he got in a fight with, with David Suskind, I think like in a fist fight with David Suskind about something. Now they're both about four feet tall. So they're like five <laughs> inches shorter than me. And, uh, and I don't know uh, what happened, but he like, he would like, inter- it does not would like interrupt the uh, thing, interrupt the audition like several, several times. So I was uh, incredibly pissed off, but it was very, very, it was a very funny experience because I went, because we were all waiting and, uh, and, and, and Arthur Miller was this tall, handsome, even at that age, really tall, handsome, imposing, man i said well you know i don't think this this is going to work with a name like death in the, in the, in the title and he laughed and patty lapone was all nervous and so it was kind of it was a that was neat but they were like they're the uh, they're great audition stories all over the place Bree just said it's just his first screen time that movie with philip seymour hoffman very scandalous i think there was some nudity in it there yeah oh, that, was, that was cheap in uh, that Philip was, I, I adore, I, I think he's maybe the greatest screen actor of all time now. And I'm so sad that he, that he, uh, that he passed away. Uh, we were there for like, well, three months in, uh, in, in Poland. And they were just 
wonderful. He was just the sweetest guy, and uh, his development was incre- crazy. And then he like, and I didn't make friends with anybody there. And he, he came back and then he like uh, got me to go to a, a coffee shop with him and was talking about developing into an actor. But he was uh, what a what a big loss as far as uh, 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 a, a huge talent. I mean, I I, I don't think, I mean, I you know, I like there are a lot of actors that I love and, and but I knew him as, a, as basically a child and that he grew into what he was. Uh, is it, bloody incredible. I mean, he was just uh, so sad that he's dead. I'm so sorry. I, I like all of his films. I do. <laughs> so I guess your first uh, soap was One Like to Live. Mm, no. no. No, it was Ryan's Hope. Ryan's Hope, okay. Uh, someone had said that on Ryan's Hope, they love you, but Ryan's Hope did not know how to write for you. Do you feel that? Oh, no, the writer was... was uh, oh, God, I... Um, I forget her name now. Oh, that's just because I'm old. She was a, an incredible writer. She'd write like this big long soliloquy. So I think she was actually a great writer for me. But the guy Paul Paul Mayer, who was a, it was her, uh, he was this, the other head writer was a big asshole and a really horrible writer. Right. And he told he told me, well, you know, you're be- you're basically always going to be a supporting actor, so don't even think about like you know. And I went, then I just quit. <laughs> so actually, that's what happened. I called up, my, I was like at uh, a fish store and I went, I called, I called up, oh, what's her name? She's so brilliant. And she actually wrote for uh, Guiding Light too. Oh God, I'll, I remember it like tomorrow. But uh, um, I called her up and said, look, can I, can I leave? And she said, sure. And that was it. Well, and then I guess that's kind of a good thing because it led you on in a couple of years to as the world turns. That was accidental, actually. I was like, really? I, I, I've been doing like a ton of like uh, Shakespeare. I was like, I can't just come back and do measure for measure in, in Washington. And it's like a huge, the Duke and that is like a huge, gigantic part. And I was so exhausted. And I never, ever in my life said, well, you know, maybe I, should, I, I want to be a star. And I, I never thought that in my life, you know, because I was a possibility or even something to be, that I desired. And I went, oh, I just want to, you know, and they then somebody said, well, they're offering you a part because they just had, they had an old audition tape from uh, Betty Ray, who was the, Betty Ray. Who's the cast. Yeah, she was a wonderful, wonderful lady. And and they said, well, uh, so then I said, oh, OK, well, I'll do that for like a few months and make me some money. And uh, so I did that for like a year and a half. And they were uh, really so that was it was sort of accidental. So but was it was that terrific. When you first started dating Margaret. Margaret hated me. No, it's not. It's <laughs> not. No, she did. She liked. I, I, I'd love to see if you interview her. You have to ask her this. But we like. I was on a year and a half, and she was on there when I got there, and I didn't. We really didn't run into each other terribly. And then they put us together like in a, a, a storyline, and uh, I was. Uh, she's the most talented actor I've ever met in my life. I mean, really. She is. Great. She she can she can just do bloody anything, and it was actually horrible for me because I I thought that every other actor that I met after that should be able to do what she does. No one just can. No, but they didn't. I mean, if I were if I could talk to her directors, I would just say let her do anything she wants to do, because she's you would never think of it. I could like I would make up, I would make up stuff and like in, in the middle of scenes and give it to her and she would like run with it. And uh, so I said, well, we're, we're great together, aren't we? And she said, no, you're like average. And I went, crap. <laughs> you're not that, you know, and so I went, oh, God. But I think that's exactly, my perception was, cri- was, was absolutely right. She was incredible. And I was about average. And so then she, so that's the way it, that, that kind of went. And, uh, and, kind of- and, and, and I like, like, was like, I, I accidentally fell in love with her. But I didn't even kind of know it. I thought I fell in love with the talent, which I really, 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 truly did. But I think, you know, you're a guy and you don't you get the, all those feelings mixed up. And I was kind of like in love with her as well as like her talent. And then she didn't. But, but, but while we were on the show together, I think right at the end, we started to get together. And she went, well, he won't go away. So I'm, I might as well be nice to him and go out and like have dinner with him. And that's what happened. And then we're, that's where we are still, actually. It's the same thing. So, so she, still wow. has dinner, she still has dinner with me. And we have two kids. Hard, uh, for her not to, 
like you considering the the roles y'all played. I mean, Tom and Margo, and you know, it was a lot. That was that was really kind of neat. Yeah, it was. It, yeah, and there was a nice place. I mean, they had like a really brilliant, like Larry Brigman. You can't find a better actor than him. And then you got uh, oh, uh, Craig to throw in the mix, which he's going to be on next week. Scott Scott will be on next week. Oh my God, Scott's wonderful. He's a yeah, wonderful he's guy. Good. Wonderful. Actually, actually, the last time I saw him, he was directing. I, I forget what it was, but I, he was directing a, some kind of thing in front of a camera. I have no idea what it was. And we were, and he was, he, you know, he was like the boss. And I was uh, doing some sort of part. And he was, uh, he's, he's terrific. He's a terrific uh, guy and a terrific actor. Oh, I agree. And y'all had some really good scenes together in those little turns. We did. <laughs> I think y'all did. No, I, I, did we ever like? I don't think know if we were on. Well, maybe we were, but he was like, he, yeah, you're right. I might be wrong. No, I'm usually the one. So, what was that first day like on Eyes of Little Turns? I mean, that was um, huge. Uh, actually, it taught, that I, I learned a whole lot from that experience because when I was on Ryan's Hope, I was a theater actor, and so I you, you get everything into your hard drive, you know. Your memorization. Right. So you, I, I like would do, you know, the Shakespeare. I would like memorize the whole part. I'd be the first day of rehearsal. I had everything memorized, and it was in my bones. And then, then you can start directing me and doing stuff. And so I thought that's what I would apply that to doing uh, TV. So I was on Ryan Hope, and I would. I, this is what I would do. It's so bloody weird. I would. I did a 10, 20, 30 thing. So uh, three days from when I was going to be doing the thing, I would do it like 10 times, every scene 10 times. The next day I would do it 20 times. The next day I'd do every scene 30 times and then I would go on. Well, can you imagine what that's like if you're doing like, if you're in every day for five, for five, five days a week, it would be like, you know, that said that you're doing like 60 times every day of some right. scene. And that's what I would be doing. When I got on As the World Tours, it actually comes because of Margaret, because Margaret would go in and she would go like, she would, <laughs> she, I'd have everything like memorized down to like for like a week before I'd know the whole thing. And she would be in there like looking at the script and go like, I haven't even looked at this. And like right before you're doing it. And I'd go like, what the, are you kidding me? And she'd go, uh, let's, you know, let's do it. And she would like just go on and just do the bloody thing and be brilliant. I'd go like, I know what she's doing. I'm going to try to learn to do what she's doing because what I'm doing is so much work. And so that's what, that's, that's what it was like with her. And that's what, uh, um, you know, because they were like, on as the world turns, there I was a lawyer, and they uh, were writing me like twenty-five page monologues and stuff like that to, for lawyers speak, and I was like doing them like they were Shakespeare, and you know, trying to do every little tweak and everything like that. And so I was like really uh, kind of a maniac, and uh, and she really got me out of that, and I learned that. And then afterwards, I could like after like uh, six months of her tutelage. I learned what she was doing, I think, not I couldn't do it as well, but I could like, I remember really like I was on uh, Santa Barbara and I would like, I had us uh, doing a scene with a guy that was uh, a Latino and I said, uh, let's do this in Spanish. And he said, okay. And so they did tell everybody, we did the whole scene in Spanish and they, and they bought it. So, we did, you know, and I'm not, I don't speak Spanish. So we would do stuff like that. And that was all from, that was all from Margaret. So. Well, I mean, uh, when, as the world turns, well, it turned out to be pretty gone good for you. It was when you won your first Emmy. What was that? Yeah, like? that was odd. <laughs> that was very odd. I never, no, I never, I uh, didn't have anything to do with any of those things. I got like a really bad reputation for, I, I saw something of which I never read stuff in the, in the, um, the periodicals, but somebody's saying, well, you know, such an asshole because he doesn't, you know, participate so much and I went I thought I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this anymore because I'm pissing I'm making people angry at me and I and I don't mean to so I uh, I told uh, uh, was I think on was it when it started the guiding light I said don't just submit me for this stuff but they did and so they yes. kept on doing it but then I got like uh, Paul uh, the producer Paul I forget what his last name is. Um, I said, he said, you don't want to want to be. And so he didn't never submitted me again. So that, that's, that stopped that. So I don't, well, you know, somebody submitted that's all. you cause you won two lead actor awards after that. Yeah. But that's, you know, I mean, it's just, it's like, you know, 
So who's the best French, French impressionist, neo-impressionist painter of, you know, 1981? Really? It's not nah. that kind of thing. It's not, you know, who, who's, who's the fastest guy in 100 meters? You can, you can find that out. But there's some, some guy in Alabama someplace or, you know, Maine that can run faster than him. So, you know. Oh, well, yeah, you're right about that for sure. You know, I'm, uh, well, luck, I'm, I'm lucky and I appreciate it, but I don't, you know, I don't take it that terribly seriously. Then you went on to Santa Barbara, and two years later, you landed Buzz Cooper. Santa Barbara was incredibly delightful. A. Martinez is one of the most wonderful human beings that you will ever meet in your bloody life. He was just a terrific guy to, to be around. And they were very nice and very inventive, and I, and I just went there. I had a reputation for not being able to take direction. That I would give directors horrible, producers a horrible time, which I suppose was deserved. But I want, I want to change this, and I said, I'm just going to do whatever they tell me to do, because I never, you know, I never realized that that's, you know, like, well, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, you tell me to change a scene like this. Well, I can't. That's not what I want to do. It's not going to be a good a scene, and I didn't think that. Well, okay, if you think you're such a good actor, why don't you say I can do what you want and still be good? And I didn't do that, but I did that in Santa Barbara and went like, whatever you want, you know, I'll do it. And I, and I was changing things all the time. And uh, that was a very happy time for me. And of course, that's was, part I, of developing that character, though, is you know that character or you're making that character. So, I mean, it would be more your knowledge of how they should be than. I, you know, but that was. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That's that's a very good insight. But I didn't think of it that way. I mean, they offered me a part it was stupid. I was doing a Fool for Love off Broadway and I, and I didn't tell anybody where I was and I would go to like uh, uh, Fire Island and go swimming and then come back at night and do the, and do the play, which was like a, a long thing. So that, and so for, when they couldn't get a hold of me and my agents finally got a hold of me and they said you have to decide, they've been calling us for like a week, they have to decide like tonight whether you're going to do this other, not, not the part that I did, but another part before that. Uh, and it's like for a million dollars for like nine months. Well, I've never been offered that in yet, really. Yeah. And I said, well, and you got to decide right now. And I went, well, right now, no, like a moron. And I and so then that was that. And so then the other thing was like the Keith, Keith Timmons, that's the character's name. Uh, and they, uh, I think. Actually, just changed. It just changed when we were there. But uh uh, I, I wanted to find somebody who could weasel his way out of anything because that's not, that's not really me. And uh, um, I got a good, Jed Allen, who was like an actor on the thing, was a really, really sweet, sweet, yes. wonderful man. We, we were doing a scene. He said, Justin, the scene sucks and it's because of you. And I went, well, okay, Jed, what? He said, well, it's because you're not giving, you're not confronting me with anything. You're not having, they're not giving me any, you, you, you know, you're weaseling out of everything. And I went, okay. And then he taught me that I, I went, OK, I'm going to confront you. And so then that ended up making a much better scene. So it was a good the acting thing was a very good lesson. And they had really good actors, Lane Davies and, uh, you know, they were t t terrific. A. Martinez, oh. they were just, just wonderful. I mean, A. Martinez was uh, I did I was doing a, a scene with him in a in a he, I had him in a, he was a, he was a cop, I think, on, on the TV show yes. and uh he I somehow got him in a jail cell because I was a district attorney, I think. And uh, so they had like a big, long monologue for me to do. And so I went and I've been like doing this. They wrote me like tons and tons of like lines. And so I went, you know what? I'm just going to invent this thing. And so I, I did a scene where I was like being um, insulting with him ethnically through the whole thing and tr just trying to crack him up, like doing, you know, Hispanic jokes. Right. And uh, so he was doing that and they said, well, no, no, oh, that's great. But like, you know, get, get it done in three minutes. And I went, OK, so change it. And he was like, he was, it was a, uh, it was a really fun thing. All of us together was a really fun thing. It sounds like it. It does. So um, did you get offered the part of Buzz or did you have to try out for that? Because it seems like that part was made for you. I mean, you played the part so perfectly. No, I think I hadn't. I've uh, like I haven't auditioned. I, I've auditioned once in the last like thirty years, so I haven't done too much audition. I didn't audition for that, and and they uh, 
change it. I mean, the, the, the approach I take with soap operas is because you do so uh, such a volume of work that you want to get them off your back about like where your uh, uh, parameters are. And so you do crazy things a whole lot and they go like, well, it's just him. So don't give him notes because he's just crazy. You can't like. So I did a whole lot of that. And I was like, really, I mean, people are coming up to me go like, Justin, you know, there's there, there there's something about acting in front of a camera. You can just raise an eyebrow. You don't have to do all that crap you're doing. And uh, so, so I, I it wasn't really in and, and one of the writers who said. Made the mistake of saying in in, uh, in print that that uh, this was uh, what did he say? Basically, it's, the part was so good, no actor could screw it up. I forget what the term was that he used. And I went, they said, what do you think about Justin Deese doing that? And they went, well, we wrote it so well that even he can't screw it up. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, <Challenge> accepted. <laughs> so, yeah, right. And so then we had like about six, six, six months of that. And then it ended up, and, and then uh, they had a, oh, God, there's another writer there. It was, they had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer who was on uh, uh, Santa Barbara. He's a crazy guy. Every time I met him, he's a different person. He looks different. He dresses different. He talks different. I mean, he's crazy, but he's brilliant. I wish I could remember his name. And uh, I, uh, he, was get, he was either getting fired or quit, like after six or nine months. And I went, well, then I'm going to have to change this thing. Because if you're writing it, uh, I can do whatever you want. But if somebody else is writing this stuff, then I'm going to have to change. And I said, so I, I changed it to like a very uh, ordinary kind of like uh, husband kind of guy, you know, and and so that's where it went for like almost all the time, but like after the, 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 the next 15 years. Well, the Coopers were kind of a crazy family. I mean, fun crazy, not bad crazy. So, yeah, they were kind of they were very good to identify with as far as like their own problems and stuff like that. They tried really hard and failed and they, you know, but they kept on trying. So I think that was well, y'all. Represented the more of the everyday person working. Frank was the cop. You ran a, a club or the yeah. restaurant. You know, you didn't have billions of dollars like the Spaldings and the Lewises. So, I think that's I think that's why people related to your character so much because you would not believe the people that when I posted about doing this that were just thrilled about it. <laughs> they tried to write. They tried to write actually. Uh, Jill Farron Phelps, who was the producer, who I think brought me on. She was a really wonderful woman. She is a really wonderful woman. She's someplace out in California right now. But uh, they tried to write a one-man show for me where I spoke every word in the script. The, the uh, network would, and I didn't know anything about this, which, I mean, it sounds like a bloody horrible idea. Well, the network wouldn't, wouldn't write off on that. So they did as close as they possibly could. So I had like 90 pages of just me talking. Now I don't wow. by that time I didn't I don't memorize until, and so they did that and I was going holy mackerel. So it was kind of like it was. So part of your memorization, you you said earlier you were doing the twenty thirty count. To, to yeah, thirty twenty. Ten, yeah. Ten. Were you able to do that with the soap operas? I mean, because you've got forty fifty pages. No, I did that. Uh, I did that with Ryan's Hope. And actually, it was Margaret that got me out of that. And, and as the world turns, and then I don't, I don't even look at it before I get there. And uh, it goes into my short-term memory, which now I'm being old. It, was, it terrifies me because uh, I mean, my, but I had uh, my kids. I was doing going to do a play after I after they canceled the show, and uh, I couldn't memorize like three words together, you know. So because of my it was a high blood blood pressure thing. So um, no, I don't. I didn't. Uh, Bernie Barrow, who was on uh, uh, Ryan's Hope, said, Justin, the way, you can't work the way you're working. He was a, a really wonderful stage actor and teacher and, and a really wonderful actor. And uh, he said, you can't do what you're doing. And, and I went, oh, no, I have to do what I'm doing. And, and, then, and then I realized after working with Margaret that uh, I did not have to do what I was doing. And, and there's a whole other thing. So, no, I don't. But I don't know how I would do it now i don't know what would stay because i can't remember my own name for like you know that's the i've uh, got my little script over here to yeah, <laughs> my right. notes to the side right uh, but i mean <clears throat> you and uh beverly mckenzie 
love you two together. You made her so much better <laughs> person. Me? Alexandra. Oh, well, no. I, and Alex. I hardly work. With, she's very, she was very nice. She, oh, God, I think she, she told me off one time. I think Beverly said, said, uh, look, don't do that. Whatever it was, whatever I did, you know, and I went, oops. She was uh, imposing, she was like, she wonderful, wonderful actress, but, uh, you know. Is she still around? Um, I don't think so. Okay. No, Beverly passed away. I'm not sure. I'd check on that. Um, but <laughs> another love of your life on the show, Fiona Hutchison. Oh, God. She was so good. Oh, I can't even, I can't begin to say how good she was. She was like just every bloody, any kind of, anything you could throw her, wouldn't throw her off. She would do anything. She had everything memorized. She could cry on cue. She could laugh on, she could do everything. Fiona Hutchison was like just uh, perfect. And I, I, I had uh, great luck with every single woman I had on it for like about, you know, we're talking about theater for about 10 years. I had the worst leading ladies that I've ever, you know, that was like trouble every time. And I want, I just wanted to like work with guys. And then, uh, Margaret and, uh, as the world turns, it started to turn. And then, you know, like I got in light, they were like, just everyone was fabulous. And Fiona, you cannot possibly get any better than her. I, I love Fiona. I loved her on one life to live. Uh, I actually follow her on Instagram, and it's kind of, it's enjoyable to me. She has a pet chicken <laughs> named, named Chicky Mama. That's what she calls her. And she videos her, and this it's the smartest chicken I've ever seen. I'm sure. It, it, it really is. She gives it tea when she, she's having tea, and it, it's a, I love her Instagram. I'm trying to get her on the show. She said she'd look into it. Oh, well, she should. Uh, yeah. She made me smarter. So, you know, me and the chicken are... And her husband is a, a wonderful, a wonderful John. guy. And a, yeah, John is a, is a terrific actor and a writer. So yes, he is. And somehow, and I think I misspoke. I said Barry McKenzie, and I meant Marge Doucet earlier. Oh, Marge Doucet! Oh my God! I was getting the Alexes mixed up when I was oh, saying oh, you yeah. and oh, you no, and no. Mar Alex. Marge Doucet is like one of my. Oh, she was. Oh, I adored her. And Ron Raines, who's a, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, yeah. a stage stage actor and one of the greatest voices I've ever heard in my life, and mu musically, yes. uh, he arranged for us to uh, her uh, like a four her four leading men, of which I was kind of like the last. Uh, we'd come and see her, so we 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 uh, with Margaret we came over and like and and talked to her. She gave me actually one of the of the two best acting notes I ever got in my life was one from a guy named William Russ, Rusty Russ. And he said, I was like doing an off, off Broadway thing. And he said, Justin, you know what Marlon Brando would say to you as I was banging my head against the wall about to go on. He said, I said, what? And he said, it's just a play. And if I'd taken that and March would say, I talked to her and she said, Justin, like when you see yourself, when you do stuff, I said, I never watch what I do. And she said, well, how are you ever going to get any better? And I went, oh my God, you're telling me this, I'm 60? And she was right. I didn't, you know, I never occurred to me, but she was, Marge was wonderful. Was just. That's what I meant when I, you, when I said you humanized Alex, it was Marge who I was talking about. I loved you two together. You know what I mean? Oh was, God, she was, she was, I just, I, you know, when we were on a, uh, a, a nighttime uh, a show that we like canceled after like one, like whatever, 13 or 14 weeks, something and uh, called Studio 5B. She was like playing George Grizzard's wife, and uh, I was doing something else, so we didn't really run into each other. But uh, you know, she did. She had a, a, a pretty good career outside of all that stuff. So she was like, oh, yeah. and she was, uh, she was the sweetest, and she uh, she was just a, a wonderful lady. Yeah, you're lucky to she meet. She seemed that way. Yeah, uh, Bree is asking about the ninety-page dialogue. Was that the dinner fire? That was an epic performance. She said. The diner fire, sorry. I don't, yeah, I think so. I think it was a fire involved. So it was like, yeah, it was like, it was like, it was me talking all the time. I was going to say, you you were the head of the family, the Cooper family. So when things really went wrong, you did have dialogue as far as, come on, y'all, let's get together. We got to do what we got to do, basically. So yeah. you did have quite a bit of dialogue, you know, as far as monologue. 
Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really, I never really understood camera acting. And so uh, really good camera acting is like you don't, you, um, I, the, Kevin Klein, who I went to school with in Juilliard, um, when he, he won an Academy Award for a fish called Wanda, I think. And then somebody said, well, somebody, somebody said to him about something else. Well, this actor just makes faces. And he said, I won an Academy Award just making faces. And you go like, oh, my God, he's right. I mean, he's brilliant at it. He understands. And so it's what you do with the, you know, the camera acting is a different thing. And I came from, uh, you know, stage acting, which is like more listening than looking. Right. So I never uh, uh, developed that way. How did you feel about Guiding Light ending? Did you think it was time or? I did. Uh, well, I wasn't surprised because it cost so much money. I mean, there were all the uh, all the um, reality shows and stuff like that. They cost any money to make, and you don't need to pay actors or have unions involved and you write scripts and lighting and all that stuff. And so it, they're very expensive. I mean, what goes into uh, I, I used to, the the plague of like soap opera actors were like, uh, uh, you do them all in one day, right? One week in one day, you go. Like, you want to kill them because all those lines in one day? Are you kidding me? And so, and all that production stuff, but that's what it, it requires. Uh, you know, they could do like a talk show or they could do five in one day easy, but it's it costs a lot of money and it's a lot of effort from everybody, from the crew to the cast to everything to, to, to put on one of those guys. So I, no, I wasn't, I wasn't Desti terribly surprised. What do you think the Desti F soaps are going to be now? I mean, cause they're slowly like, I think I, uh, the, days just went to Peacock, you know? Online I, I, I think it's that I think they have to uh, I was going to do a proposal with somebody I think they need to change they were kind of a sentimental thing where you get you get involved with the people and I think they have to be more uh, uh, topical and more inventive um, I think th that there will be something like that every day um, but it will have to be reimagined I can I can think of what it would be, but you will need to have like really. I, I remember one I I, I was going to propose at one time and and uh, at one time on uh, I think Guiding Light, we they had assembled like a really whole bunch of like about maybe twenty really terrific actors, who could handle stuff like that. You know, could invent things on the moment and do things really terrifically, and I was and I think with if you got like a group like that together. With a good producer and and you know the thing is that they should they what soap operas do is they try to make a a a, a, a movie a real movie out of uh in one day with with a script doing it like you here's the script you do what you do all this stuff and it's not uh, robert altman did a a, a a TV show, and he did like kind of what I thought you should do. The strength of a, of a soap opera, of a daily thing, is that you shoot it at the same time it's happening, so you don't have to match things and everything. So what happens, happens. So direct it that way. Do those kinds of things. And uh, so you can be very, very imaginative. And I thought like, you know, like in the background have a, 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 a right winger versus the le left winger old, old men beating each other and throwing each other out of the window as like people fall in love in the front thing. And you would do, you know, have stuff, you know, like do all that stuff and have it all clumsy, but just amazingly uh, that would, they don't do that. And you could do that in a soap opera. So I think as they find that out, um, you could do a daily TV show that would be just extraordinary, but you have to have really, you know, wonderful people, you know, the, the, and, and you would have to, you know, the writers aren't there. They don't have all the people, you know, the, the writers should be there on with, there should be one writer on the set with you talking about stuff and they should be like that. You should be inventing stuff on the way. And if a, if a, if a cameraman sees an angle that he wants or does something like that, he should like be, so everyone's creative thing should be this way, as opposed to here it is, do it, do it the way we wrote it. And it's going to come out great. Well, you can't do that on a daily basis and have it be very imaginative or very right. stimulating. And so I think that's what they, they missed as they tried to do, you know, basically they were doing a radio show and trying to produce a radio show into a, uh, a, a feature film. You can't do it. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, you've got three wonderful kids. I do. You do. Are any of them into acting? 
No. Well, the one that's sitting across from me right now does, does great impressions. He can do like any accent in the world. <laughs> He's like, he, he, no, they're not. None of them are that. Uh, Sam, my uh, eldest son, uh, uh, did some acting, and I don't think he's into it now anymore, and I don't know if Joe is. But, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rejection factory. You know, it's, it's very difficult. I can't advise any. Olivier, Olivier said, the only way, the reason you should be an actor is if you can't possibly think there's any other profession you could possibly be happy in. If that's the only one you can think of, then go ahead. But it's very, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, like Joe's six foot two and handsome and, and can do impressions out the kazoo. So, you know, he's perfect for an actor. But You're not I would looking the voiceover. Uh, I hear Joe? that's a new thing coming on, coming out around. Me? Joe? Well, either of you doing voiceovers. Uh, oh, that's a whole technique. You know, you have to like, it's not as simple as it seems. Uh, I had a guy in my building who did it and he just like, he would like, and he was like made a, a trillion dollars on it, but he like, like work for a couple hours a day doing stuff, you know. I did. I've done some voiceover work, and uh, and yeah, yeah, Joe could do it for like the accents and all that stuff. He he, he can like uh, you know do like eighteen accents in like ten minutes. So he's terrific. But I don't know if he wants to do that. I try one accent, and they all sound the same, and I think they're different. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever look into possibly coaching or teaching classes for no. acting? Oh, well, no. I actually I I, I I I went to Juilliard, and then I couldn't afford because I had a wife and a child and everything. And uh, our, my, uh, uh, I, it, it, uh, my f money fell through. So I took a, a scholarship at Florida State University. And part of it was uh, I was getting my, my, my master's in teaching a couple acting classes. So I did that there, um, uh, which was kind of fun. But it's, uh, no, I never thought of it after that. So, what do you like enjoy doing in your free time? Me, I, actually, next week I think I'm gonna. I I, I talked Joe and he gets for a uh, birthday present. I think it was. He offered me to take uh, flipping classes, so I'm gonna take a flipping class. A flipping class to flip. Heard that. Yeah, I used to be able to flip, and I actually, can't flip anymore. Yeah, right. Oh wow! But they I have like. <laughs> well, they have they have pits with like you know soft things and the landing, and so that's what, so I'm going to get a guy and do that. That's what yeah, I do. There's no way I could do that. So, if your kids were wanting to act, would you recommend it? Or I, well, to tell you the way the things are, I mean, originally I would say no, but I mean, like their careers like falling by the wayside. I mean, it was one one kid wanted to be a a, a, a priest, the other kid wanted to be a a, a cop, and I thought, well good professions that people need those to be just like, we still need cops and priests and neither one of them want to do those things. So, uh, and then I thought, well, what advice can you, you know, this is the first iteration I know when the, when my dad told me, we were very close. He knew the world and the world he told me about was the world I was going to, was entering. Uh, the world they came into Joe being born in 1993 and Joe, Sam in 1989, uh, was changing so fast that I couldn't tell them what was going to happen. And now you see vast amounts of careers going to either robotics or uh, artificial intelligence or stuff like that. So I don't, you know, you know, and I don't know what to tell them. They know better than I do. So, you know. Well, technology's advancing so fast. I mean, I yeah, don't I mean, keep up with some of it. I don't keep up with all of it. I mean, if they want, if show business is a, is a good idea, but you can almost... I see there was a guy on TV that was talking about, uh, I forget what he was doing. I forget what he was doing. But he had uh, made a movie for $15,000 just a few years ago. And it made $200 million. Wow. So, you Incredible. know, that's what they can, that's what they can do. And I have no advice about that. So, you know, uh, it's it's a it's a risky business, and I you know, it's a, so the world the world changes so fast. I can't even you know. Talk about world changes so fast. How did you all survive through the COVID situation? 
Actually, Joe actually maybe saved maybe saved his, both his parents' lives. We, the COVID got really bad. It was really bad in New York City right away. It was like really huge. Yeah. And he said, "We got to get out of here." And I was like, "I don't want to go anyplace." And uh, and Margaret said, "Okay." And so we went. She has a a, a, a beach house down in North Carolina. And uh, so he said, "We're going to go down there." And we went down there, and uh, we stayed there there for like four months. And until it got like bad down there and it got nice up here. And so uh, that's how we, de- I didn't deal with it. So he dealt with it. Right. It, and uh, uh, the COVID thing, I, you know, it's, it's, it's all very interesting. It is. I think 8 billion people are too many people. I agree a hundred percent. I wish I'd get that to the bottom of it. However they need to, but you know. Well, actually, there's a thing for, you know, the, the uh, I'm a big liberal, but I wouldn't I would only say that to conservatives. But if I had another liberals around me, I would never say I'm a liberal because they would say I was an asshole and actually a conservative. <laughs> but um, I think we've got to get together on all this on all this stuff and say what's you know, it's just it's it's just crazy. And we're going to lose the, the, the idea of the country, I think, pretty quickly if we don't watch ourselves. So, yeah. I agree 100 percent. I think we're headed down a very dark path. Yeah, there's a there's a place called One Small Step. It's a um, and it is where they get you. I'm going to join it. And it's where they get like a liberal and put it together with a conservative and you get on the phone and you talk just two people and you start talking together. And they said it's amazing how much you can agree upon. You know, media and everything, uh, you know, it, it, media thrives on conflict and on anger and on big emotions. And so that's what you see on either side, you know? And, uh, but people are, I mean, I, I, uh, most of my good family friends and I'm a liberal, most of my big family friends are all conservatives. So they're all Republicans and I get, and they're wonderful people. They're not horrible people. They're wonderful people. And I can't believe what their convictions are, but you know, I would, I would tell you they're just the nicest people in the world. And I think we got to get, you know, we got to get together with each other and talk about stuff and uh, in a really human way and say, because we, if we lose this democracy, it's going to be really bad. I think it's going to be bad for the world. Uh, this divide, I mean, marriage was bad enough. Divorce rate was bad enough, but I feel like this divide is going to even make things worse when you have, you know, a Democrat, Republican couple. Yeah, and I think the right uh, now. The issues are when you have issues like uh, artificial intelligence, nuclear war, uh, diseases, you know, all kinds of diseases, uh, things like that. Those are all they're not you, you can't like say, well, I'm going to go back to being America or Mexico or something like that because it crosses borders. So right. you have to get together with people. It's, the world's changed that way. It's happened. It's too fast for anybody and certainly too fast for my generation. We get, just got to like get together and say, no, let's just be, be let's, you know. Or we're going to go back to living in caves. Well, your phone call, you ought to, my dad should be the one you should choose to talk to. Okay. <laughs> I don't think you'd ever get into budge. He's complete opposite of you as far as political politics. Oh, oh, well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so yes, there's your is. first victim. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, I know I, I, I like him. I like, and I like, all, he has a good heart. And that's what we want. We want good hearts to meet good hearts and create the world that way. Right. With, good, with great intentions, you know, For you can sure. say I want I, I want bi- I want big uh, I want a lot of government. I don't want a little government, but they got but, it's, but we want to govern ourselves. I think it's a good idea now because the other thing, you know, you know, it didn't work out too well through history. Right, right. I agree. Because because Jesus Jesus and Buddha don't are not like uh, up for election. <laughs> True. And they don't have to campaign either. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> well, Justin, thank you so much for being here. Okay. If you want to hang up. Well, okay. I'm sorry. No, right. go ahead. I, no, that's it. I love you. You did great. Take care. Okay. <laughs> if you want to hang out right. backstage for a minute, I'll be back there in just a moment. Just okay. Hang for a couple minutes. I want to thank Justin Dees for being here today and talking with us. I'd like to thank the NFF for sponsoring our show. To learn more about necrotizing fasciitis, just visit www.neckfasci.org. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great upcoming episodes. And please remember to be kind to one another and have a great day.